it's going to be a year recovery. You won't return to your level of play t- until 18 months, if ever. And we'll know at the four month mark if your meniscus holds because when you start activity, it may re tear. How did you feel when I told you if ever? Oh, that one? I think one? it's a terrible thing oh, to say. Oh, yeah. listen, yeah. listen. Hey, guys. Cheers, hey. first. Cheers. Your recovery. Thank you, brother. Yes. You Cheers, go. my guys. Let's all, right. all look in each other's eyes first. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to kick it off as organically as possible, obviously, mm-hmm. we're here with Uninterrupted, um, talking about athletes in the road to recovery. You guys were instrumental in, in my recent recovery. Couldn't have done it without you guys and your expertise. I'm going to let you guys talk a little bit about yourselves. Uh, right. For Brees, probably first. I'm a French physical therapist and osteopath. I was the, the osteopath for the French national team of basketball from 2009 to 2013 with the Tony Parkers and all those yeah. guys. And I moved to LA uh, in 99 from Paris. Ever since, after three, four years that I opened the practice, I started to work with a lot of professional athletes with a special team hot cases, rehab. Yeah, yeah. I met a dear friend of mine. We've been working together, hand in hand, in the same office for probably 10 years now. That's correct, yeah. I was so happy that you decided to work with me. I'm glad we succeeded. It was a big teamwork. It's not just us two. Yeah. It's a surgeon, the Nets, um, yeah. Mike G. With that being said, I will uh, yeah. shout out uh, Dr. Riley Williams, yeah. uh, who was a surgeon. Mike G, uh, Mr. Do It Moving on Instagram, uh, Craig Sanchez. We, we had a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And you. Because oh, uh, nah. it starts with you, honestly. At the end of the day, you put in the work. You put in the day of work every single day, so... No, nah, I appreciate it. But I, shoot. Con- I concur, as you a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I have yeah. kind of a trick question to... Okay. What are ways to cool the joint? Oof. Ice, but uh, you can't do it anymore. Also, There's a new study that says yes. ice is not good. Beyond ice, though, yeah. is, there, is there anything that can decrease inflammation? So, go ahead. Cryotherapy is an interesting concept. The whole idea is after workouts, you have systemic trauma in the joint structure. But really, it's about muscle damage. That's why you wear clothing that compresses. And the reason yeah. you do that is that actually there's good studies. French studies, by the way. Oh really? la la! <laughs> <laughs> it's the oscillation of the muscle that causes the damage. So the more you can compress it, the less there is. Now with cryotherapy, there was a great study about anaerobic workouts, uh, Mm -hmm. actually cooling down before working out, which is an interesting concept, so it reduces muscle damage. And also, uh, getting back to the concept of uh, thermoregulation, you know, lowering your core temperature before the workout, it almost could be uh, utilized as a natural steroid. I have a question. This is a personal one now. I actually like to shower before games. Is that counterproductive? Cold Uh, or a hot shower? It's it's not hot like that. It's kind of like lukewarm. Medium? Try cold. Yeah. There's people who react really well to cold, and there's people who react really bad to cold. There's no one recipe fits all. So and I usually would take a cold shower after the game. Like yeah. I'm actually giving you guys a lot of little Spencer Dimity secrets. And mm-hmm. beyond, obviously, uh, this most recent ACL, I actually had a pretty durable stretch, especially yeah. in Brooklyn. That was one of the things I did because I know you guys talked about cooling down the core temperature a lot. Pre-game, I would take like kind of like a lukewarm shower, like just. But that was more so to feel fresh, mm-hmm. right? That was a that was a yeah. psychological thing. It wasn't a Feel-teen. you know, yeah. But post-game, I would always take a cold shower. How was your sleep? afterwards. Oh, that's one of the things that would definitely happen. I would take the cherry juices. I would sleep well. Mm-hmm. The cherry juice was a, was a Brooklyn Nets uh, thing, so shout out to Brooklyn Nets again. Um, yeah. Appreciate y'all. Oh, very bright. But the cold shower was definitely a nod to, to DeBaron. So. When you first got injured, okay, you, you got injured. The right, last one? On a, yeah, yeah, the last one. What was your mental state when you first got it versus how you're going to attack it? Yeah. How did you keep yourself motivated to overcome the, the various you know, obstacles yeah. and, and rehab? Initially, I just kind of went, damn. So I get hurt, I felt a little grinding. I actually thought I tore my meniscus. I didn't think I uh, tore my ACL because right. it was completely different than the first one. Like I know from, from the jump, like something is wrong. Like I'm rolling around the floor, I felt like my knee was on fire, like all that stuff. This one I was just kind of like, that was weird. Mm-hmm. And I feel a little bit loose, but I'm like, I can walk, it doesn't hurt too much. I go to the back, and I'm fully expecting him to say, look, like your knee's pretty stable, it's intact, but since you hurt grinding, we're gonna have to get you to MRI. I'm thinking like, all right, what are they gonna do? Shave my meniscus down a little bit. We'll still have 90 plus percent of this thing. We're gonna be back in four weeks. We win the championship. That's, that's where I'm at. I get back to New York. Um, I had the MRI. They tell me, look, mm-hmm. partial tear to ACL, but you know, it's gonna require, mm-hmm. require surgery. Now, yeah. as opposed to the first injury, he, he says like, it looks like you have like a bucket handle tear. It looks like T-shaped on the lateral meniscus. And then there's some debris over in the, in the medial. I'll know when we open it up. Mm-hmm. And you know, your MCL is messed up. So, I'm already in the mode of like, all right, if that injury was that bad, 
we coming back for the for the championship. <laughs> we're gonna like, win. Your famous line, right? Like before we uh, start a PT session, you're like, hey, we're gonna win. So a lot of people, when they tear their ACL, they have something catastrophic happening to them. They don't have prior context. As humans, context is so huge. Like That's we function point. in life like with a negativity bias, and mm -hmm. and it's cool because biologically it's designed so that we survive, right? right? Like if we touch a stove and it's hot, don't do it again right. because you're gonna get burned. Or we go to a cave and a bear's there, don't do it again because he's gonna eat your ass. Yeah. You feel me? Like with this, it was like, oh. I faced the big 500 pound grizzly bear. Now we got a little bear cup. I'm like, we gonna try our hardest. Between injury and surgery, I think it was seven or eight days, one of the two. So it wasn't even like a, a long process. I know a lot of guys wait yeah. a month or yeah. two months. It was immediately like, hey, we're gonna hop on this. We're gonna get this one out. We're gonna have the surgery. We're gonna, we're gonna get back. When I tore this one, they told me, it's gonna be a year recovery. You won't return to your level of play until 18 months, if ever. And we'll know at the four month mark if your meniscus holds because when you start activity, it may re tear. How did you feel when I told you if ever? Oh, that one? I think one? it's a terrible thing oh, to say. Listen, yeah. listen, listen. This is why this one you was were so like, optimistic. Fuck you? No, 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 no. Remember, I'm a 20 year old kid at the Shit, time. Yeah, yeah, you don't know. I was scared and hurt mm -hmm. and wanted to cry. And also, because, you know, I went into the surgery understanding there was meniscus damage, understanding I had torn my ACL and all this other stuff, but I don't really know what that means. Mm -hmm. I'm 20 years old, yeah. I've never had an injury. I've gone from four years old to 20 yeah. with no nothing. injury. Yeah. So at 20, I tear my ACL. I think they said it was going to be a two hour surgery. When I got up, they were like, hey, look, Spencer, you were in surgery for four and a half hours. I'm like, what do you mean? They were like, your, your lateral is like string cheese, but your parents were adamant that, they, that we need you to stitch it together. They said, you are not allowed to cut this man's meniscus out. That's great. Do whatever you yeah. can to stitch it together. I'm coming out of anesthesia like, you said two hours, mm -hmm. it's four and a half hours, you're telling me string cheese, you're telling me <laughs> the meniscus. I'm, I, I don't even really get what a meniscus is at the time. Yeah. Like, I hadn't done my research at, to the same level. Like, I'm sobering up completely off the anesthesia. Like, what is going on? Tell and you're me, in a cast. In a cast. Can't walk for seven weeks. You won't return to the level that you're at for 18 months, if ever. We, you thought you were going to the NBA draft in three months because you're supposed to be a lottery pick. That's probably done. You probably need to think about going back to school and getting the degree. I'm all screwed up, right? But I came back from that one in seven and a half, eight months. There you go. And was at training camp, full go, Detroit Pistons. Yeah. So beating that, and then when they told me like, hey, you got, the, you got the baby bear type of injury, but you got all the resources, all the, mm -hmm. all the power, all the other stuff at your disposal. I was like, all right, let's, hey, okay. let's go to work. And I think that's obviously something that, no pun intended because we're all interrupted, but I think LeBron has done well. When you sign a 90 plus million dollar Nike deal coming straight yeah. out, I think he immediately yes. started putting money yeah. back into his body. You see 18 years of excellence, and that only happens with the diligence and the work. With all the wear and tear that an athlete puts on his body, and particularly in this particular road to recovery, a question I have for you is, uh, do you think it's worth it? I mean, do you get paid enough? I mean, I'm, I'm always saying you guys don't make enough. Unless yeah. you, when you travel with the team, you really understand what you guys yeah. go through. But yeah. your personal opinion on that, I would like to hear it. I mean, selfishly, I'd, I'd, I'd love to sit here and say I want every athlete to get paid more, mm. right? myself included. But no, just to, just to step back and zoom out, I think it depends on how your career goes and, and how you were raised. Right. Me personally, especially as a firstborn son, like you take care of the family. Right. right. And that the community is bigger than the individual. What I've been able to accomplish is something that no person in my family has really ever even dreamed of. If the personal sacrifice yeah. makes my family, my line, the Dinwiddie name, all those things, then it makes it worth it. If I was raised to think self and what makes me happy, I would probably still do it because basketball is what I know and love. But yeah. like just in general, you would think twice when you have these type of injuries and things like that. I think what helps you push through is, is that uh, uh, bigger feeling of purpose versus mm. just like happiness, right? Mm. Like, you see a lot of guys get injured and they're just kind of like, well, you know, I did make money and like, all right, I guess I'm just out of it because I think they're starting to think about personal wear and tear, personal happiness. Can I walk, you know, at 50 and 60 and all that other stuff? Right. And coming off the 335, like I could have technically retired, right? Like I wouldn't have been rolling or nothing, but I could have retired. That extra little oomph like probably comes down to family, Elijah, you know, and, and things like that. So. Yeah. That, that it, to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I've always been curious about that with you because you have an incredible amount of in, in, in intestinal fortitude. I think is mm -hmm. the word. I don't know how do you how do you say that in French, by the way. Fortitude. Okay. <laughs> okay. <There we> go. <laughs> fortitude. The fortitude. Fortitude. <laughs> there we go. I know you guys hear me talk a lot, 
Right. But you never, guys. Never. <laughs> Stop it. I want you guys to uh, give to, to the viewers because you guys are the experts here your three key takeaways and three key values for road to recovery because people don't don't have access to to, mm -hmm. to men like you and, yeah. and you guys are literally elite and the best of the best. One of the things that I think is really important is to educate the athlete and involve them in the rehab process. And especially since you, when you're working with elite athletes, you have to gain their trust. Yeah. They involve them intellectually. And I feel bad because when they stick a mic in front of you, yeah. they don't really know who you are. Definitely. And a lot of these gentlemen have this incredible amount of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And also, is, is, as they age, one of these, the diet is very important. One of the things is reduce systemic inflammatory responses in the diet. And also, re educate them on recovery. I mean, everyone loads. You remember Fabrice telling me there's an Italian system, there's a French system, they the all Russian have different systems, Russian yeah. system. There's this on yes. loading. And there's this on recovery. On how, yeah, and how to load. It's like, you know, everyone teaches you how to jump, but who teaches you how to land? Mm. Bingo. Well, what I'm saying is uh, another key takeaway, I, I believe, in this whole, uh, whole thing is the ability to recover and educating them on, you know, baths to take. One of the things I have them do is do pine bark soaks. At USA Basketball, they thought I was crazy. I mean, they're going to throw us out of the wind because I had these guys <laughs> soaking in... Uh, and, and raw pine bark, and the reason why is pycnogenol. Pycnogenol is a vasodilator, and, and what it does is it helps replenish the, uh, you know, the ability to recover. What about you, Fed? Uh, for me, the mental aspect, mm. e either through the season or when you get an injury. I had a, a lot of players that actually came to my office, to our office, and I was like, listen, you're not ready to start working. Yeah. You're depressed. Yeah shit going on in your life that you yeah. haven't taken care of. Can you please go someone, talk to someone, fix that brain? Mm. Yeah. And then we work. And the big two things, I'm gonna finish with those two, it's diet and sleep. Let's talk about food. chef. Diet. You make $10 million, you can afford a chef. For sure. You don't make $10 million, you have food delivery programs that sure. gives you exactly what you need for 60, 70 bucks. So Definitely. if you're in the NBA, you you're can't find a way to eat healthy. Yeah. We had education, diet, recovery, we had mental, mm -hmm. Strength and conditioning, mm -hmm. diet and recovery. Yep. Hearing those three keys from each of you is very informative. I think my three keys are, are kind of an amalgamation of, of y'all's. I think the mental is huge. And going through this rehab process, being somebody that has to look in the mirror consistently, that's probably something that, that guys don't do enough, right? You gotta continue to do your checks and balances. There are things that you're gonna have to cut out of your life, you know, and clear the clutter. It's huge to be able to do that because that self-awareness and that peace allows you to kind of continue to move forward. I think um, the biggest thing that's helped me in my NBA career has been establishing a routine, mm -hmm. you know? So you gotta be receptive to the knowledge, but then you have to establish a routine that works for you. If yep. you wanna lift every off day, you wanna lift, you know, and seriously do this is your warm up or this is whatever it is, it kinda gets, uh, you kinda get in a mode of being put on autopilot. And one of the things that you guys have talked about is decreasing central nervous system stress. And the more that you can kind of be on autopilot in a good way, not, mm -hmm. not going through the motions, but in a good way of just like not having to constantly think and fight and, and, and fight upstream and, and produce all this friction, but just understand, okay, it's off day. I'm going in at nine. I'm going to get my lift. I'm going to be done by 11. I'm going to get my recovery. And, and you become systematic with it and put in the work. Then you get to flow through the season and, and, and approach things in a mm. pragmatic fashion. So mm. you don't, uh, get this abundance of stress. And then lastly, I would say the recovery things you guys touched on, diet and sleep. So. And getting to a point where you or the athletes trust himself enough yeah. to be okay with that, yeah. to yeah. trust his instinct, because you, you hear so much noise. You have so many yeah. people oh, talking Jesus. to you. That's, that's that yeah. mental. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That clutter. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, on that note, we should do our final cheers Allez. and wrap things up. Allez, let's go to work. <laughs> let's, let's go to work, B. Let's go to work. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. I'm out of Red Bull.